Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined by Sana Lettinen, who is Research Fellow at the Transdisciplinary Art Studies Unit at Aalto University School of Arts, Design, and Architecture in Espoo, Finland. She's also docent in aesthetics at the University of Helsinki in Helsinki, Finland. She is also co-director of the Philosophy of the City Research Group and founder and co-editor in chief of the brand new journal, Philosophy of the City Journal. Uh, Sana, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Brandon. Awesome. So we're talking about your work on urban aesthetics, right? Just aesthetics of the city and our experiences in cities. And uh, I will link to a number of your articles and other work in the description. And so people can find some of your work there. Um, but I want to start on this issue that I find interesting that you've talked about in some of your work on the aesthetics of imperfection as it relates to cities and this idea that, you know, what is it to have an aesthetic experience of a city? A city's a large place that you can't experience all at once. In a sense, you have to take it block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. And it's this thing that also is constantly changing. And so, you know, when you know someone goes traveling and they visit Chicago or New York or Helsinki or London or wherever, you know, they say, you know, I had a real New York experience. But have you truly experienced New York if you just stayed in Manhattan, say, or Brooklyn or, or whatever? Uh, and so I guess we'll just start with that question. And so what are some of your views on that issue? Well, I think the city is a really interesting um, place to think uh, through many of the traditional notions of the of aesthetics, of environmental aesthetics in particular. But then again, we have to also kind of apply some of the concepts because it's a very particular place for um, for aesthetic experiences um, in, in general. So what I had been doing in my work is kind of um, combining um, environmental aesthetics with philosophy of the city in general, trying to understand how this idea that, that cities are mainly kind of human designed, human originating places, um, usually quite big environments that you cannot take in with, with one glance. Um, and that the whole idea of kind of landscape aesthetics um, doesn't really apply as such to, to cities or even cityscapes. So I've been promoting this idea that um, uh, there are several different ways of approaching urban aesthetics. Um, the one that I have been calling kind of um, macro aesthetics um, mm -hmm. relates to the, the idea that we take in cityscapes we might have a little bit distanced idea or like a distant stance um, to, the, to the city in question. Um, we are maybe able to appreciate uh, well-known landmark places, uh, monuments. Um, the, the cityscape of Manhattan is a good example of this. I think it's instantly recognizable or um, like certain how certain cities such as, as Paris, very emblematic places, how, how they look um, and what we are able to kind of immediately recognize from those places. Um, but then in addition to this, um, uh, what I have been calling micro aesthetic layer, um, in, in that sake, we are already going somehow um, into the city, into the streets. Um, we are in a much more engaged relation with the urban surroundings. Um, and that is much more happening on the, on the level of the everyday life in a way. And usually when we discuss aesthetic, urban aesthetics in particular, it's very useful to kind of distinguish between these two takes. Of course, our experience is always a mix of these two, but then again, um, there are very kind of um, like separate cases where you can see that a tourist, for example, is maybe more focusing on this kind of macro aesthetic layer. And when you are um, living in the city, you kind of focus on different things. Uh, when you are, you have to move about in the city and you have to make your way um, to work, for example. And also relating to this idea that there are these different layers of urban aesthetics, um, the aesthetic experience of a city um, always um, has to take into consideration this, this idea of, of imperfection in our experience. So we are not able to experience the city uh, fully as an aesthetic object, but only kind of bits and pieces. And that's how our experience of it is created over time. 
though it, I think it's temporarily especially uh, interesting how we take in the city aesthetically. Yeah, great. And so on the macro level or the macro layer, right, of just, you know, looking out at the the skyline of Manhattan or looking at the Eiffel Tower, right, those sorts of experience feel at least sort of intuitively on, on my end, right, they feel more like appreciating works of art, right? They It's more static, right? Um, compared to the micro level of, of making your way through the city, that feels much more like, you know, as you mentioned, everyday aesthetics, right? Um, and so maybe let's start with the macro level, right? Which again, is more like the tourist level, right? If you're in the city, you, you know, the landmarks, the skyline might not hit you as uh, an, an object of engagement as much as if you're a tourist who's, you know, seen the pictures of the city online or on postcards. And, and so what's um, aesthetically interesting about sort of the macro level experience and the macro layer of um, aesthetics of urban environments? Well, um, in my own work, um, I have been collaborating with architects, for example, and very often our way of discussing architecture, architectural aesthetics, is somehow focused on how the cityscape layer or the kind of, you can even discuss it through the notion of facade aesthetics. So we are interested in how the buildings as objects of appreciation um, make the city. Um, and of course, like everyone kind of knows that this is not the whole truth about the, about, about architecture, but it's also about creating interesting spaces and um, how our kind of life um, unfolds within these buildings, like inside and outside uh, the built spaces. Uh, but I think this kind of architectural, very object-oriented aesthetics, in a way, um, could be distinguished um, through the notion of, of, uh, of macro aesthetics. Um, also, when discussing urban art or different forms of public art, I think this is a very useful notion. So something that really kind of um, breaks the, the everyday, um, like a flow of everyday life in the city. So when we are encountered by um, interesting, important pieces of art that somehow kind of stick up from the from the the very fabric of of um build, the built space uh, i think that that goes very nicely also with the idea of macro aesthetics but it doesn't really um mean that the micro aesthetic layer of experience wouldn't be present as well so i think all of us have experiences when we like through our commute um, in in a, within a city that we are are encountered um, or encounter on a daily basis some interesting works of art and we, we are, might not be pay, paying attention to them on a daily basis but still they are part of that experience and and then also a lot of things that we cannot kind of tell beforehand a lot of interesting surprising things happen in the city not all of them are are kind of uh, positive even like um, the cities are they are dirty places and and there are like things happening that we might want to um want to like kind of avoid but also that is part of the um the kind of more mundane layers of urban aesthetics and i think that's that's very interesting i, I wouldn't want to discuss urban aesthetics only through kind of um positive notion of the aesthetics but what is messy what what is ugly what is something that we really, really kind of even makes us disgusted. I think those are very interesting points um, in urban places. And one idea um, about this imperfection in urban aesthetics is, is that it's uh, cities are always products of a lot of compromises. So all the way from the design processes, um, how they are temporarily kind of growing into being certain types of places. Um, there are things that um, we we might not accept aesthetically or that might go against the grain of our personal experience. Uh, but we also had to acknowledge that some of these things uh, might be very interesting and positive to other people. So, for example, when discussing architecture from the 1960s or 70s, which is at least here in Europe, very, very much debated uh, whether to preserve it or whether to tear it down and, and how to like really conform into these sustainability ideas um, with architecture that it seems to be like too young to be preserved, but too old um, to be in good prime condition. Um, I think these ideas that we don't stick only with the positive sides of, of, of kind of our aesthetic uh, perception in cities, um, they become especially in, important also from the sustainability point of view. 
Yeah, that's interesting, right? And one thing that you touched on is the fact that, you know, cities are sort of like living beings, right? They're sort of like living things and that they're constantly undergoing change. And so to make your way through a city or even to just look at it at the macro level, you're going to see various architectural and design styles based on choices people made sometimes a couple hundred or many hundreds of years ago, or, you know, just a few decades ago, or very recently, right? So you'll have this mishmash of new buildings next to semi-new buildings from the 60s, 70s, and then older sorts of uh, buildings. And that's really interesting, this notion of preservation and what should be preserved when an urban environment needs to undergo some sort of change, right? And what are some thoughts people have about buildings from the 60s and 70s, right? Because I have <laughs> you know, no knowledge of that. Um, well, um, in general, I I think the, the main one of the main problems is that um, they tend to be in like worse condition than many of the older buildings that already have gained a lot of very kind of general appreciation. Um, I'm not so sure that it's only about architectural styles. And and actually, in discussions with my with my students, many of whom are studying architecture or design, they have already gained a lot of appreciation to, towards these kind of um, concrete buildings, um, which um, use a very kind of different scale of, of, of colors of gray uh, compared to older buildings, which might have more colors and or ornaments. So I think it's it's also about the, the legacy of the previous generations that we, we kind of have to decide what to do with it. And, and acknowledge the idea that the future generations might have, or, or younger generations might have different ideas and aesthetic um, kind of appreciations than what, what we do. Um, so, but there is like surprisingly uh, strong, um, even kind of resentment towards these, these uh, the, the, the buildings from, from uh, this period, from kind of um, the, the last decades of the 20th century. And to me, that is, um, always very interesting coming from aesthetics, trying to understand why they are so strongly opposed to and and how could we maybe be more understanding towards as many of the ideas that they embody. But of course, it's a very complex question and a lot of kind of uh, even kind of um, ideas about the welfare state or or even like the, the kind of political atmosphere come, in, come into question. But I think it's it's um, it testifies of the city as a very kind of um, central pa central place for these kinds of debates, which bring together not only aesthetic appreciation but also more kind of ethical ideas about what the city should be and how it could be, and to whom it it should cater for in the first place. And I also like the the idea that you kind of pointed that pointed out that the city. Um, Instead of being an object for aesthetic appreciation, I think we should acknowledge that it's an organism. It's a living organism, uh, all the time evolving in in time and in space. And also, one of the things that kind of people tend to aesthetically, we actually did one survey where this this result came out quite interestingly, that people find aesthetically negative places where there is construction ongoing. And then like these construction sites are always kind of considered to be an ex uh, kind of exception in the city. Um, something like something is being renovated or something is being built. But actually when we look at actual um, places, actual urban streets, um, uh, there is like so much this kind of ongoing maintenance work going on that that we we should take it as a as a as a more like not a permanent state but something that belongs to a city also aesthetically like all the noises, all the the, the smells, the dust, um, the idea that the city is is a process. Yeah, that that's really interesting, right? And so on the process thing at the micro layer of experience, right is you know, you make your way through a city and you're inundated with all of these sights and smells and sounds and people and traffic and construction. And so that it's, you know, so, you know, you mentioned that a city is a contested place. It, it's a place of negotiation between different um, interest groups um, as to, you know, who does the space belong to, who should be here, who's included, who's excluded, and that has to do with issues of accessibility um, for people with disabilities, it has to do with accessibility for unhoused people, um, 
and and you know you interact with all of that as you make your way through the city and i'm just going to ramble here for a bit and you can do something with it right but you know i'm from a relatively small town in illinois that's on a train line that goes straight to chicago and so i remember the first time going to chicago as a kid stepping out of union station and just being completely overwhelmed by everything but especially the size of the buildings and you know i guess this goes to the notion of the urban sublime right i felt fear right like it felt like these buildings could just fall on me um and i even felt that way as a teenager going to new york city for the first time in manhattan just like what the hell is going on here just like mm. the sense of like anxiety or dread like these buildings could just fall on me at any moment um and so make something of of anything i just said please because that was sort of a, a ramble there <laughs> yeah that was a very very like uh nicely expressed experience that i i think we all can can, can easily easily share um well i like the concept of the urban sublime because it kind of links the idea of the city and the experience of the city to a very already long established tradition within aesthetic theory and and the the particular urban sublime um, kind of links to the idea that the city, uh, especially the bigger the city, uh, like doesn't necessarily have that clear limits, and at least like perceptually they're always beyond our capacity. Like we we cannot experience the city as a whole um, in in one take. Um, and it also links very nicely to some ideas about the the technological sublime. So how the the kind of um, maybe human originating powers um, by infrastructural large scale technologies, for example, how they go beyond our comprehension. And the city is also a very highly technological environment. So when we think of the tra transportation system, for example, uh, the metro here in Helsinki, we have technically only one metro line, but still like perceptually, um, you can what you can do. It's the micro experience of uh, entering into the metro, which has a quite nice orange tone. Actually, the tone of my dress <laughs> I just noticed today <laughs> in the metro, which I take daily. And, and in a way, your experience is very much uh, kind of linked to the most immediate environment of uh, of the metro, uh, the underground, um, like the, the the wagon where you are sitting, then the benches and the people next to you. But then you just have to know, like you just know and you have to rely uh, in the fact that it will take you to to another place. And when you get back um, like from the from the metro station um, up to the ground, you are in a completely different place. And that kind of underlines the experience that city is a huge, huge place, huge environment. And there is this kind of awe inspiring quality about moving in the city or just kind of admiring how the city as a system functions. Or if it doesn't function, even these ruptures, they just kind of emphasize the, the sublimity of the urban experience. And another interesting thing, besides the technological sublime, I would say that it's related to the presence of people, the kind of anonymity that we experience in large scale cities. Um, the fact that we we go like really uh, close, um, close to like we move close to other people, we, we can never know uh, that much about them, like this this, this idea of this multi multitudinous of of humanity kind of becomes present in cities and 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 like we are encountering daily uh, people uh, who have their full inner lives and experiences, and we can only maybe get glimpses of that um, when we share um, some situations together. And I think that also links to the idea of the urban sublime. Yeah. And on that last point, that's one of my favorite things about being in a city is the anonymity, right? It, unlike, you know, being in a small town where if you're walking down the street, you're going to see people, you know, are driving down the street. You're constantly seeing people, you know, and there's that recognition and there's a value there, but there's also a value of being someplace where everybody is a nobody, right? Where you are just one among the crowd, making your way, having your inner life there, having their inner lives, but there's no real connection there. And I guess that partly relates to this notion that I guess comes from Baudelaire of the flaneur, right? Which is a sort of foppish, dandyish, bourgeois individual who I guess is disinterested in a Kantian sense as they sort of make their way through a, a city. And 
What are your thoughts on the the flaneur, right? Because they're sort of like an estate of urban experience, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting notion. I uh, very often often um, referred to in the kind of urban aesthetic experience, like historically, maybe one of the the, the most prominent cases of of describing the urban aesthetic experience. Um, also, I'm a bit wary of it because it's 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 so much distanced. Like the the flaneur, it's it's always it seems to be like this maybe a gentleman or like a like a person who who is idle enough to just go about and experience the city. So not not necessarily carrying a bunch of um, things or or taking care of children or with disabilities. So I think it's a it's a very kind of um, one sided aesthetic. Um, experience or one-sided opportunity of experiencing the city but it's I, I would still say it's quite quintessential in kind of entering the aesthetic sphere of the city and, and, and trying to imagine what kind of experiences and aesthetic experiences the city kind of offers or or in in which we are able to to indulge um if we have the spare time and, and the kind of uh, ability to move around but then I think it's equally important to think about different kinds of experiences and 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 um, the um, one thing that I, I like um, about public art, for example, is that it's it's precisely that that it's, it's kind of open for everyone, uh, everyone's experience. It doesn't necessarily impose the the aesthetic side to the the passersby, but but it, it is there to be experienced without any any cost, without any kind of um, kind of even propensity that, that like you would be looking for our art artworks or art pieces. But the same goes to the whole city. Like there might be very, very small details, um, places um, which just draw your attention and you get get excited, you get interested about them, um, even in the within the hustle and bustle of, of your, your own everyday life. Yeah. And so you don't you... have to go to specific places or like institutions to, to have an aesthetic experience. So it, it's a, I think it's a very kind of liberating and democratic idea that the city could offer these experiences. Yeah. Right. That it, it's there for anyone. Right. That you don't have to pay a fee mm -hmm. to just wander through a city. And that relates a bit to something you touched on earlier in terms of technology and transportation. Right. How you experience a city depends on how you make your way through it. Right. Whether you're taking the metro or the subway, mostly to get from destination to destination, or whether you're taking, uh, you know, a bus or a tram, right, that's above ground, or if you're taking a taxi or an Uber, or whether you're on a bicycle or whether you're walking, right. All of those are different ways of experiencing a city. And so, for for my own case, right, I don't ever feel like I've truly experienced London. A, because it's just gigantic, but B, because I spend so much time underground, right, that, yeah. you know, I just sort of enter, you know, from one neighborhood, exit into another, and the in-between space is a mystery to me, which sort of makes it alluring and attractive, but also it's an unexperienced thing, right, an unexperienced swath of the city, and so, yeah, I don't know where I'm going with that thought, so help me out, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i think I, yeah it's it's really like london in, in particular it seems to be made out of these like small small villages and uh, that the cityscape like there are are of course recognizable things but the experience is really tied to what is nearby and and, and you go to one location and you you take your take your time to get there and then then really kind of maybe maybe stay around there and then the the atmosphere might be very different to other places in the same city so I think I, even though I use the word urban aesthetics or I discuss um, aesthetic matters um, in relation to cities, uh, we we always have to think about the scale as well. So big like uh, world, like global scale metro metropolises have like their their very particular features, like in a way, and 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 there, but there are some similarities about how they really evolve. Uh, how the experience kind of unfolds through through this this uh, experience that it takes time to move around, but I think there are like enough still common features that that you can discuss really small scale towns within the the kind of with the terminology of urban aesthetics, but then the the, the scope and the scale is of course different. Yeah, interesting. And so on the issue of technology, 
right in in cities and it's something that i guess we're often unaware of unless it imposes itself on us right you go to cities you're used to billboards you're used to neon lights you're used to led screens right but for example something that you've been thinking about is 5g towers right which 5g towers there have to be you know so many meters apart from each other and some cities are starting to to take over um you know, and in addition to making airplanes catch fire, um, <laughs> which might be true, might not be true. Oh, well. <laughs> uh, it certainly didn't cause the coronavirus, uh, as some conspiracy theorists think. But it, it is sort of imposing, it does add this layer of technological ugliness to, you know, not a pristine urban space, but, a you know, interesting urban space. It makes it less interesting, I guess, and, and uglier. And it, so is that something that cities have to think about is they're upgrading technologically is not just, you know, does this make people's lives better, you know, the shift from 4G to 5G, but also um, in, in terms of like practical engagement, but also like aesthetic engagement with the, the city, uh, it seems to diminish that pretty significantly. Mm. Yeah, I think the topic of these kinds of everyday technologies or urban technologies is a very interesting one as as it I, I think it hasn't really been discussed um in aesthetics um in urban environmental aesthetics or even everyday aesthetics as mu much as it should be and i think there is still this kind of aura around technology that unless you really know about the technology in question unless you're an engineer you shouldn't be discussing discussing it or like you don't have a say and we we very often kind of assume that all technologies like they are just kind of like they're necessary they need to be there and that's also one reason why their design hasn't been maybe as much considered as it could be and uh this example of of the kind of uh, jump from 4g to 5g or even 6g I, th I think it might go directly even there as many of the experts keep keep telling um it's an interesting one because like the 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 kind of the small cell towers or the small cells of the cell towers they don't the the structures needed for the upgrade are not necessarily different from 4g but we just need a lot more of them in our cities so, but still, it's a topic that unless you point out to people that have you noticed these structures coming up in your neighborhood, they might not have paid any attention to it. And I think aesthetic experience is, in this sense, very interestingly linked to what we pay attention to, how we recognize, how we interpret the things that we see. But once you start seeing these 5G structures around your neighborhood, you cannot unsee them anymore. So you kind of become, they become very, very much like much more obvious to you. Um, of course, there are also different, uh, different examples. Sometimes they can be very noticeable. And there was a case in, um, in London, in, in Islington, for example, which we were studying where um, um, with Delphina Fantini van Dietmar from Royal College of Art, which whom I've been studying this 5G aesthetic topic, uh, where a significant amount of public square was taken up by these structures. And of course, then it was much more noticeable for people who used to sit um, on this, this kind of bench type of thing. And then all of a sudden these electrical appliances started coming up <laughs> over there. So it was much more noticeable. But I think 5G aesthetics uh, as a project um, and as a topic has been one way of entering these discussions about what kind of technologies uh, exist in our cities. Um, should we have maybe more kind of public um, discussion around these technologies? Are they needed in the first place? Do we need as broad uh, as kind of um, the same coverage around different parts of the city or should there be kind of like uh, places where 5G um, isn't necessarily needed? Like, do we need to really have them, them as, as much as we do at the moment? And then the other question concerns the design. Um, and globally, um, if you look at different cases, there are different examples of how to deal with these structures. So in the US, for example, there is a long tradition of concealing uh, of camouflaging these different different types of technological appliances that you need. Sometimes they they work quite well. Sometimes they are quite interesting, and they can even be very humorous. So you can hide a five G mask into like making it look like a fake palm tree, for example. Um, and then there are like kind of the other tradition, which just lumps them on top of buildings. 
And one of the questions that we have been also raising is that whether these uh, appliances or these uh, structures could already be in a way considered when like more in the architectural design so that even though they we know that they will be upgraded every 10 years 20 years whatever the cycle is uh there there would be like more um like like a ready position for these types of uh, technological structures but i think this is a it's a very interesting entry point into aesthetics of urban new urban technologies yeah, right. Because just thinking about, you know, like early, like photographs from early 20th century New York or Chicago, where there's just power lines and telephone cables everywhere above ground, right? And so your experience of making your way through the city is just looking up and the sky is just occluded by wires, right? And then at some point later in the 20th century, those get buried underground or hidden or concealed in some way, right? And I guess the American style is to conceal these new technologies to make them blend in so that they're unobtrusive. Whereas I guess some European locales, it's more like, yeah, we need we need them up, we need them up quickly, we need them up cheaply, we need a lot of them. And so we're just going to put them everywhere. And so I guess that is, you know, the aesthetic sensibility there seems to be more relevant on the American side than maybe the British side or elsewhere in Europe. Yeah, and I think there is also this idea that, like in in old European cities, um, you you make it clear what is the old part, and and kind of that you are able to distinguish these structures from different period. So so you you're not trying to make them look antiquated, for example. Um, but these discussions uh, I have been following in Italy, for example, uh, the implementation of solar panels in in cities such as uh, Florence. <laughs> So the, the the need for for green energy for solar power and their ability to really really use uh, solar power there is, is is significant. But then aesthetically, the the that change can be quite drastic to the idea that we have of how the the these cities how Florence should look like. Uh, but then I think this is really really like um uh where aesthetics could be of help. And, and the idea that that if we if we if we are doing a significant kind of um, um, like work to significantly um, like get get green energy make cities function in a more sustainable way, uh, are we able to negotiate our aesthetic ideals towards this idea that solar power, power like panels are what make the city the city top like the rooftops of Florence as beautiful as they they could be so instead of seeing the technologies always as a negative uh, negative um, idea or like some negative implementation because I think our aesthetic values especially around these types of everyday topics or environmental topics they also evolve to include new technologies uh, one of the paradigmatic examples is um, uh, wind turbines has been discussed in environmental aesthetics for already uh, quite quite long time, and and it's an example that I I still use in my um, in my lectures, and students always kind of bring up um, this idea that it's I I keep telling it because it's like with every course there is a, a many students who, who who tell it in the same way that yeah like my parents really hate like wind turbines that they they ruin the landscapes but I kind of think they are cool like uh, there is something like nice about them like you can like this sort of idea of the technological sublime seems to be sticking with people who have already been around wind turbines for a longer time they are they're already used to seeing them in the landscapes but also they really realize that we we need them so we become much more kind of aesthetically uh maybe attuned to seeing them in a positive way yeah and and yeah i live in a small relatively rural area where outside of the city city town i live in thirty three thousand people right uh they're just wind turbines everywhere right so if you drive along the interstate you're going to see groups of wind turbines here here and there and my attitude that toward them is positive right and i think you know so it's partly like the good making feeling of oh there's something happening that's good for the environment that's good for the world that's good for my children etc um but it's also the fact that there wasn't anything there to look at to begin with apart from corn and soybean fields right <laughs> illinois is flat there's nothing there whereas i guess if you're going into you know a more majestic environment right like the rocky mountains or something maybe there it would be ruining the landscape um 
I, and so, I mean, so I, that that relates to you know one topic I wanted to discuss, which is you know how I guess sort of the political and the ethical can affect our um, aesthetic experiences in urban environments with respect to you know the, the the technological right. And so, you know, one thing that's been under discussion for the last I don't know decade or so is hostile technologies, right, that are meant to prevent. Uh, unhoused people from sleeping on public benches, for example, um, or from, uh, you know, getting into people's recycling bins and, and trying to take out glass to, you know, make some some money to get some food. Uh, and there it's very much, you know, when those started being introduced in Chicago, which is the city I most often engage in, right? Like, I, I just wasn't aware of them, right? They're unobtrusive. They're just, you know, the benches are curved, or they have like spacing in them in such a way that no one could sleep there. But then when it was pointed out to me that, oh, that's to stop unhoused people from sleeping there or from entering that space, then it's like, oh, that's really, ug that's morally ugly. But also, I feel it's like, aesthetically, I'm aware of it, and I can't help but be aware of it. And it makes the thing that was otherwise, you know, aesthetically neutral, it, it makes it aesthetically negative, right? This is a negative aesthetic mm -hmm. object that's, you know, harmful to my aesthetic well-being in this place in addition to the moral one. And so what are, you know, some views or what are your views on the issue of hostile design? Yeah, yeah, I think mm -hmm. you, you gave a really good example. And and um, Robert Rosenberger has been writing really, really mm -hmm. nicely about hostile design, about these examples that you also gave um, in his book, Callous Object, for example. I really love that book and the kind of implications that it has to aesthetics. Uh, I think the, the kind of uh, friction that the ethical uh, idea of, of impeding some uses of the benches is causing to your aesthetic experience your aesthetic judgment of the bench uh, could be um, discussed through the notion of aesthetic disillusionment. Uh, Sheryl Foster has been writing about it at, at least um, in the 1990s. And I think this, this idea still very much applies to many of the things in our everyday environments and, and, and these kind of human originating environments, especially human designed environments. So once we gain, and this is a very kind of basic idea in environmental aesthetics in one way, when we gain new knowledge, uh, new information about the thing that we are are admiring or that we are not even paying that much attention to. Um, and when we come um, aware of the sort of ethically very dubious implications of the of the object in question or the place in question, then our uh, perception of it starts to change. And sometimes it can be quite, quite drastic, like we really start despising the place because it, it's been designed in a way that kind of um, like turns down a, a lot of people or like uh, pushes away a lot of people from using it. Um, or then it can be kind of um, deteriorate, like our aesthetic, um, um, like positive aesthetic experience might be deteriorating over time when we kind of like really, really realize that we don't want to support that kind of urban design. But I think one interesting thing about this um, hostile design in general is that to a certain extent, all architecture is about in, like, kind of enclosing uh, certain uses and, and kind of encouraging certain like other uses. Um, and in cities in particular, this idea that we are um, we're emphasizing certain certain kind of affordances of places and then then hindering certain uses. It's always present, but to a what degree? I think that should be discussed a lot more. These examples of hostile design have, have become much more um, common in recent recent years, in recent like maybe two decades, I would say. So we have also become a little bit too used to those 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 kind of uh, kinds of structures in cities. And also it's something that that we don't do the hostile design it's it's not only in relation to certain groups of people but we we have been like um enclosing like animals like more than human lives out of cities for for such a long time like these spikes for birds or um how we really try to um control um what life forms uh, do we do we find in cities so it also has this kind of interesting spectrum from from the animal world to our our kind of human human world and social uh, systems that we we like that thrive in our cities so i think that is that is something that 
um, this idea that the ethical is always intertwined with the the um, aesthetic in cities, it's like it 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 makes you see the city in a different light, like quite quite concretely, I would say. Yeah, and that sort of is the flip side of the presence of technology in cities. It's the presence of natural things in in cities, right? As to whether the the streets and boulevards are lined by trees, whether there are no trees, right? Um, you know, how many uh, sort of natural spaces are there in cities? How many public parks uh, are there that have, you know, natural spaces and, and you know, the presence of, you know, bees, butterflies, other insects, and then obviously, you know, or is it, you know, like New York where it's just like pigeons and rats, right? Like that's <laughs> basically, um, you know, the, the, animal life forms that you interact with. So that's really interesting. And so yeah. what what thoughts do you have on the, you know, uh, role of the natural, which is obviously going to be curated yeah. in, in urban environments? We try to control it so hard. <laughs> I have actually been supervising a lot of uh, graduate theses for landscape architects recently and urban nature, different forms of urban nature is of course like in, in very deeply in their profession, but how to uh, really encourage, how to see, how to support these um, kind of undesigned forms of nature in cities is becoming also exceedingly interesting for, for landscape architects. So it's not all human designed, human planned, uh, but how, how to tend to these very often even surprising forms of that nature gets in, in the human designed environments. Uh, but I think this, there's an interesting shift that we we have to take into consideration that that the, the idea that we we cannot con we cannot control we cannot like in a way uh, over design cities as places and and if if we try it wouldn't be good in a way even for humans so so kind of allowing this sort of um, this sort of. Uh, <laughs> freedom for nature to take its place in cities. And, and of course, it can be also more designed. There is a lot of emphasis on building green roofs or turning um, these neatly mowed lawns into urban meadows. And all this, I think, is a very good and uh, good sign that we want to create healthy urban ecosystems. We want to support um, pollinators coming back back into cities or, or even urban agri agriculture. There's a lot of interest in that. Um, different forms and also technology can be very much of assistance in in even producing food inside cities, which was still very much like um, 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 a very foreign idea um, for the for the affluent at least. I think in in, in certain I, I keep thinking that there were chickens in Helsinki like just maybe eighty years ago, still in the backyard. So um, the, the the nature has always been present um, in, in in all these various forms. But we have to maybe blur a little bit the line between ourselves and the rest of the nature. <laughs> so this kind of dichotomy doesn't exist anymore, hopefully in the future. <laughs> yeah, right. That's interesting in that, you know, so much of urban design seems to be precisely about, or at least historically about keeping nature out, right? Because nature is viewed as a threat in some way or a harbinger of disease, right? Carriers of disease. And we need to keep those out whereas now the shift has been exactly right in terms of sustainability you know green roofs green you know sides of buildings with plants on them um etc to make uh you know to improve the health of the people living in cities but also just their mental well-being right because encounters with nature just improve us psychologically and emotionally but i guess also aesthetically right because you know you you turn the corner you know, for its, you know, neon lights and LED screen, screens, and all of a sudden it's, oh, there are trees and butterflies, right? It's sort of surprising and it leads to, you know, I guess, a you know, you talked about like the disillusionment, right? Uh, or, you know, the disenchantment. Well, it's, you know, re-illusionment or, you know, re-enchantment <laughs> of urban spaces by introducing, uh, you know, not technology, but reintroducing nature into those spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there there is like ample evidence from environmental psychology, for example, of the benefits of of like greenery and even even to the extent just green kind of improves your health and and well being. <laughs> but whatever the case, in a way, I think 
uh, adding greenery to cities. And I'm also like, I'm not opposed to technology. I just really want to it us to have like a much broader discussion about how to do how to like do do technology in cities in a way. Uh, but adding greenery, adding this kind of variety through different forms of nature or like like um, um, in, in the form of greenery mainly, I think it, it really adds to the variety. And to me, cities um, at their best, if I give my kind of own personal opinion, is, is their places of diversity, aesthetic diversity, as well as biodiversity or architectural diversity. Of course, we we admire also aesthetically places we, which have very very kind of homogenous architectural styles and 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 kind of can appreciate that. But um, to a certain extent, many many places which we value highly in in general, they they tend to have a lot of lot of things like to see, to smell, to experience. Um, so so definitely greenery and different forms of nature adds to that. Yeah, I love that. And so I think we'll end there. So Sana, thank you so much for joining me. This is a really terrific discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much.